Welcome back, my dark means, to the dark void ruled by me, Nile Fifty One. And today we're back to our uh, random reactions to, uh, to uh, more random reactions. Yes, that's what I was talking about. And today, uh, this is just a curious video. <laughs> yes, curious. Uh, that I just randomly found one day, like last week. I was just randomly found. Uh, which is looking on my you know, on my console when I have YouTube on there. Don't start with me on that. And then I just happened to see this like randomly, and I decided, you know what? Oh wait, no, not next week. Oh, weeks before. There's like other videos I did. There's like another video I did instead. But yeah, it's, it, that's a whole other topic. But yeah, I just randomly, and you know, I put this on the back burner until I got a chance to get get to it. And I just randomly just started. I think this is ten days old. I have no idea. Please let me know in the comments. But yeah, and I just randomly saw this, and it's like, you know, I'm curious about this. I want to see this. I want to make a video on this. And yeah, that's what we're here now. And also, this is from a Curious Archive, and it's about the monsters of the apocalypse. So I was like curious about this, so we decided, you know what? Yeah, let's start with this. So yeah, we're gonna be watching this, reacting to this, and I'm very curious. Well, uh, I wonder if this is like, uh, like you're gonna be showing what potential apocalyptic monsters are gonna happen. Which, technically speaking, I hope we do have apocalyptic monsters one day. But either way, yeah, here we go. Let's begin, and we're gonna start. Like I said, I will leave, uh, well, like from Curious Archive, and I will leave a link to the video down below, so you guys can watch it without my beautiful voice. All right, so let's begin here. Nothing short of apocalyptic. Yo, what's up? I, I hope it ends with a monster. Yo, what's up? I hope it doesn't end at all. Doomsday would probably be a huge bummer. Yep, it you would. You and everyone you know annihilated. Every human achievement, every memory, every cone of gelato erased. Oh, no. But if we're choosing apocalypses out of a Ooh. lineup, if the world is going to end, I think a monster might be our kindest method of exit. Yep. Nearly every mythology ah! has a creature whose job it is to wipe things clean from Armageddon. It's strangely universal. Yep. Big monster! And I don't think that's because, ironically... It's the gentlest ending we can imagine. Yeah, because they're not gonna destroy us all one go. I'd like to prove this with a banana. There's a banana. Specifically, <laughs> this banana from the channel Yeti Dynamics. A computer simulated moon sized hunk of potassium. The object appears downright apocalyptic, particularly when it blots out the sun. I've seen a lot of the giants in the space ones so far. It's his poem, The Second Coming of All Things in which a colossal beast threatens to plunge civilization into darkness. Yates's monster is as close to an archetypal herald of doomsday as one can get. A demon with a gaze blank <laughs> and pitiless as the Sweet. sun, fear personified. Because it would be scary, right? To be snuffed out by some malicious giant, to witness destruction on Unless a scale they just beyond let the boundaries live. of anything glimpsed I think that'd be bad. Though not actively malevolent, a banana that size <laughs> colliding with the earth would still obliterate humanity, kicking off a Yatesian end of days, and seeing this okay. aside, that should be a frightening concept. If we unless we live. When I gaze upon the great banana, or even a more traditional apocalyptic I process, just be... I find I'm rarely as scared as I should be. Well, take a speak, I was just looking are, at this. Oh, theoretically, well, that's the end. horrifying than small ones. Get past a certain blockbuster threshold of destruction, I think devastation can start to feel like entertainment. Look no further than the rise of online shorts depicting absurdly oh, yeah, look at that. vast creatures wreaking <laughs> havoc. Animated to mimic something oh, that shot thing. on a phone. I was just saying, well, that's the end. Posted with the caption, what would you do in this situation? I was just saying, well, that's the end. There's being that there's nothing you could do. Yeah. And I think joke is the right word. Yeah, there's nothing I can do. I mean, why? These shorts seem Might as well be accepted. More fun than frightening. And they are fun. Because while, yes, a giant monster destroying everything would yeah. be horrific, if a threat is so big there's nothing you can do, uh. you might as well watch the show. Oh yeah! Sorry, that happened. But yeah, if you if there's like a giant monster, well what's the point? To seeing world ending dangers I mean, just, as high uh, well, spectacle. I mean, sit down and just eat look popcorn. At the legacy of a character like Galactus, a supervillain who helped establish the trope of a planet eater in pop culture. E. Galactus is the apocalypse at its most glorious uh, over the top. The untold His story of the sequel. The result the of writer of that Stan Lee gleefully pushing the boundaries of scale. I said to Jack, make him the biggest guy you can draw. When viewing entities with this magnitude of destructive power, 
Oh, the guy. Lives lost become impossible for audiences to quantify. When the threats are this massive, the camera pulled this far back, humanity disappears in the same way that crowds in a disaster movie become faceless cannon fodder. It is exceedingly difficult to remember the human cost of a large-scale mm -hmm. apocalypse. It is exceedingly difficult to remember Part the two humanity. If you think about it, if we, some people would literally run for their lives, but, uh, well, that's the end of time. I would just be sitting watching the show. Ends of the world. Point at this point. The first ending is I'm not saying you should familiar. do that. I'm just saying. Out of control flooding, leveling entire communities, destroying housing, displacing families. The second ending is a little less familiar. Giant pig monsters, once frozen in ice, are seemingly coming to smash civilization to pieces. Both disasters loom large in the mind of our protagonist. Oh, the girl living in the hidden monsters. Bayou. How could they not? To her, these calamities are not headlines. As part of a community living south of a protective levee, the floodwaters are literally at her doorstep, each day bringing another catastrophe, another symptom of a world. Mm -hmm. In his book, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, biologist eh. Thor Hansen states that when consequences seem distant, the human brain is perfectly capable of simultaneously understanding and ignoring abstract threats. He's citing George Marshall there, a writer famed for his research into how humans are, psychologically, oh, sorry, we're just getting engrossed in here. equipped to handle our current climatological crisis. Because if a problem seems too large or too gradual to be imminently solvable, our brains will just sort of shut down our fear response. <laughs> yeah. We might feel a gnawing, non-specific dread about the state of things, sure, but it's hard to fully process an issue both massive and removed. It's true, I mean, what are you gonna do when you see something so apocalyptic? When you see something course, so apocalyptic, it's harder what's the to point? Forget a threat will your brain work? Will your brain work? Though there's an argument to be made that the more literal monsters of beasts of the southern wild are an abstraction, an attempt by the protagonist to understand. Oh, well, we do have them. It's called wild hogs. There's ultimately nothing. We have them in the south over here. The danger she faces. When the film was shot on location in 2011, real flooding frequently interrupted the production. Flooding which has since become precipitously worse. Is it surprising, then, that a child encountering such a calamity might imagine a different sort of ending? One equally colossal and destructive, but at least a little more theatrical, a little quicker. When compared to a slower mm. exit, to an apocalypse I mean, that I, appears on the I news can't really pet a bear and think of a dog. Avert, is it so irrational to dream of a monster? The show, Carol and the End of the World, perfectly captures the apocalyptic anxieties of our current era through two devices. There's Carol, and there's the end of the... ...hurtling towards Earth. It's unclear, but we believe... Does your dog know it's the end of the world? Every second is precious now. Mm -hmm. The end of the world part is self-explanatory. An ominous rogue planet is hurtling towards Earth, and while not a traditional monster, the object promises an ending of similar bombast and swiftness. What isn't self-explanatory is Carol's reaction to the planet, because with just seven months in front I mean, if you know, it's gonna be over. Carol, an ostensibly oh, normal middle-aged woman, isn't up to a whole lot, and she knows she should be. Everyone else is up to what you'd expect when time is a dwindling resource. Do what the heck you want. Lives they've always wanted. Because why would you spend a second doing anything you don't enjoy if there are only so many seconds left? But Carol isn't changing her routines. She is still folding her laundry, still trying to schedule doctor's appointments, still sending checks regarding her expired credit card statement. When I first watched this show, a part of me wanted to shout at Carol, to ask, what are you doing? Don't you know that time is fleeting? That the end is coming and these moments are- Wait, how do I think I know get? what this theory is. And a part of me understood completely. Because we're all Carol to an extent. We're all in the digital age, yeah. aware on some level that any number of looming catastrophes might cut things short. And oh, yeah. yet, it's extremely hard to hold on to that fear, to use it to break from routine. Maybe we just be accepting at that point. But stay the course while trying uh. to ignore our ever-present dread. What else can we do? 
One of the more <laughs> pointed aspects of Carol and the End of the World is a company, openly called The Distraction, where Carol and others like her do menial office tasks for the benefit of seemingly absolutely no one. But at least when busy and overworked, it's harder to remember what's hanging over him. It's just, yeah, just for a piece of... The devastating like I said, like for peace of mind. Of the world, if you think about it, best I mean, if you play a video game, the equally devastating uh, do you, is it for distraction purposes or for you to be happy planet, about identical like, in both to escape reality, and trajectory. which is the whole point. Much of the actual plot, however, revolves around a different sort of impending disaster. A wedding between lead character Justine and a man who appears to make her profoundly unhappy. For the first part of the film, most people aren't aware of the coming planet, but it's implied Justine has a unique cognizance of Melancholia's trajectory. It was up. So why, with Doomsday on the horizon, would she attempt to stay on a course that's causing her misery? I really wanted this, but I do. There are unseen layers to Justine's sadness. The title Melancholia referring to both the name of the incoming stellar object and to melancholic depression, a mental condition that Justine is living with. It is ambiguous how much of Justine's melancholy comes from external circumstances and how much comes from within, but still, it seems inarguable uh. that the approaching wedding is a source of despair, and yet a part of her still seeks to go through with it, as if she still has all the time in the world. Ah, uh, confliction! The truth both Melancholia and Carol and the End of the World confront is that we're not very good at living our lives like they have an end. Because even if nothing goes wrong planetarily, our time here is fleeting. That's how it works. But knowing that rarely seems to help. Everyone in Carol at <laughs> the end of the world could have, of course, been living like each moment mattered all along. Just like how Justine could have called off the wedding ages ago. But even with the end in sight, choosing to actively change trajectory, to break from routine, can feel impossible. Well, I mean, think, which makes sense because while waiting for the apocalypse, being in the routine actually makes you feel like something ma itself. makes sense in your head. And though with most rogue planets well, in fiction, the moment of impact is instantaneous, before that comes this nightmarish limbo, a period of protracted dread rarely experienced with conventional Tuesday monsters, who mercifully tend to get right down to business. Perhaps the most notable exception Yo. to this is Unicron from the Transformers hey, Unicron. franchise. A Galactus-inspired world leader that merges the most harrowing aspects of rogue planets and rampaging beasts. A living stellar object yeah, he's just here to eat. often doesn't slay its victims in the initial collision. Instead, they are slowly digested within the planet's intestines, the very boundaries of their death gradually broken down. It's a yes, it was. The worst but I wasn't alive back then. Both sudden and agonizingly drawn out. A paradoxical form of doomsday that could surely only exist within the boundary. Oh, my eyes. Part 3 Fallout. Here we go. In a matter of seconds. Atomic. The, the atomic apocalypse. Different apocalypse. Atomic giant monsters, planet, is the kind or of atomic. It's difficult to encompass with a single metaphor. Like many apocalypses, it is frequently represented with a monster, either a fiery behemoth standing tall as Which a mushroom I prefer. cloud, or a mutated human, a victim of lingering radiation. Which I prefer to see a giant monster. Sure, an element of what makes a nuclear detonation so monstrous, but I think monsters alone fall short when trying to convey the horror of an ending both instantaneous and gradual, where it's almost better to be caught in the blast. Ah! Than to suffer through what follows. Sorry? I wouldn't worry nearly as much about the atom bomb if it were to kill you right out. What scares me is that awful gas that deforms you. Shoo, aspects shoo. of a nuclear apocalypse. I'm not gonna say this, but would you rather like have it fast or film uh, the wind continue blows, on? Based on the graphic novel of the same. I'm not saying a, to choose. I'm just saying a couple in the choice English countryside who learned that global nuclear war is only days away, and yet at first neither seems particularly worried. They're worried about scraping the paint on the doors they used to build their pitiful fallout shelter. They're worried <laughs> about not having enough custard, but not about the bombs themselves. They refuse to change their habits because they have unwavering faith that the information contained in their government-issued pamphlets will protect them. 
It's an outlook emblematic of oh yeah dudes that one must only that was still around the world uh, still around trust me I went to school and that's the kind of thing was still around I'm not joking cover that's the first thing to do the couple's optimism I'm not joking entirely let me know if you are like around like uh, back in the 2000s and this was like still in school so a few more bombs don't seem worth making a fuss over even after the detonation comes and it does come. The couple thinks they must be in the clear after surviving the initial blast. What they don't realize, what they can't imagine, is Oof. that a nuclear blast is more than an explosion. Oh yeah. In the pan, fallout is an invisible hell, a plague that creeps into rain and groundwater that cannot be outsmarted by simply ducking and covering. Nope. Take more than a few bombs to get me down. The confidence of the couple in when the wind blows that everything will work out, even after the sky turns dark and the nation falls silent, speaks to a larger disconnect between how we perceive apocalypses and what an apocalypse actually looks like. Uh. Earlier, I spoke of crowds in disaster movies, how they cease to be individuals, but separate from those crowds are always the protagonists. The chosen Supposedly. few who, when doomsday comes, Which will some people will probably cars think that they would be the, what the rest the of humanity person. cannot. I think it's hard when imagining the apocalypse not to picture yourself as one of these sole survivors. Someone who is somehow And thanks to video games and media, ahead all of us think we're like that when the time comes. Of probably. Ignore, of course that most everyone sees themselves in this way. Yep. That in the face of any real disaster, roads will become clogged with countless people with the same idea that some calamities simply can't be hightailed away from. I think most of us know that on some level. You know what would be funny still, if this actually happens, if you would just go on day to day, the end of the like world just, eh, also apply eh, to yeah, yeah, and just keep walking uh, around. Clear up the broken glass and all the debris. All in all, I'd say we've been very lucky around here. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that when the wind blows does not end with the couple driving away to safety. Radiation isn't the kind of ending you can escape nope. post exposure or outwit with a few minor precautions. It is not the sort of problem that can be solved by not thinking about it. And yet. The same year, yeah, a lot of ads here. Was released a very real nuclear disaster. Oh, if there's one through line that emerges that in Svetlana Alexeyevich's book Voices from Chernobyl, a collection of interviews from survivors of the catastrophe, oh, yeah, the Clinton most famous meltdown, one, it's that government officials consistently downplayed the risks of radiation exposure. No one said anything about radiation, one survivor recalls. The doctors kept telling people they've been poisoned by gas. Ooh. There is a sense in these interviews of the profound disconnect between what people were seeing and what they were being told they should see in a scenario that darkly reflects George Marshall's writings on the human ability to That's ignore the sad thing, abstract is that threats. If people and say one thing, massive, the more likely will believe problem, that. Authorities decided to outwardly pretend the fallout simply wasn't happening. Until it finally came out later on. Despite or attempts at cover up, we now yeah. know there is a monster. Still oh yeah, there is the real monster in Chernobyl. there. It's called the Elder. There it is. Foot, a gargantuan mass of melted corium so radioactive that at the time of discovery, just standing next to it for five minutes proved lethal. And if this creepy Oof. mass were to ever hit groundwater, the resulting explosion would kickstart a new disaster, likely even more destructive than it is, the first. It would destroy the Today, environment, that's what I would have. The happen. elephant's foot, now solidified in concrete and steadily dropping in radioactivity, doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. But it's still surprising to me that the solution has been to just leave it there. Then again, isn't that usually humanity's solution yep. when it comes to large-scale threats? To ignore them, and then if that doesn't also work, plus, say there's nothing we can do. Hey, giant kraken! In also plus, hey, what are you supposed to do with something like that monsters, big? Giant alien squids are spreading across Krakens! the globe, and yet people are treating the situation like they would any other far off disaster. Hey. They're acting like there's nothing to worry about. Though we, the audience, can tell the creatures are capturing city after city, that the zone of infection <sighs> is rapidly growing. Very few characters seem to be panicking. 
fine. This town isn't gonna get hit for another two it's days. It's fine. In despite it's fine. the record of ignoring dangers, a part He's of like that dog. It's fine. that if actual honest to god monsters showed up, humanity wouldn't continue on with a business as usual approach. And there's a part of me that understands what the director meant when he called this film the world's most realistic monster movie. People aren't running and screaming. Oh. Their life goes on. It's, it's kind of normal. There is, almost reassuringly, like a procrastination. Of running and screaming. Like procrastination. Like you know it's going to happen, but you're going to do it, but also attempting you to just hold it off. Quote unquote, realistic. In 2008, this meant shooting the whole thing in found footage style shaky cam, a stylistic approach that, in a way, makes the film feel like the ancestor of the what would you do in this situation clips of today. Like those videos, Cloverfield mm -hmm. strives for a kind of point of view emergency. What would happen to, uh, to the point where the film was advertised less like a movie and more like an event you could choose to live through. The way the film is an experience experience of what it would be like if you were there when this giant monster attack occurred. But is Cloverfield believable as a real incident? In a strange way, I hope so. Running because away? This scenario, horrifying as it appears, is actually preferable to the one in Monsters. Yeah, it's because it just... Everyone is taking the uh, yep. Everyone is Running away for your life. But they're all screaming together. No one in the crowd is saying, it's not that big a deal, or we should still go to work tomorrow. We still do that anyway! I can't say that recent experiences have given me an abundance of hope in humanity's ability to <laughs> handle or even learn from global crises. If you think about it, remember it what happened with the virus incident in 2020? Pandemics. Mark Hohen's bomb right I mean, seriously, remember 2020 was the year of that of the virus, those and then we kind of just put it on the wayside. Difficulty fully processing. I'm not joking. People were saying that, oh, everything's all good, it's everything, is everything's all right, and we just went on on our normal days. And Actually, no, I still work that year. And ignore. During the height of the pandemic, oh, there you go. a lot of people posting about how even if, say, zombies were rising up, a lot of employers would still ask us to come into work. That's what and I was saying. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. At which point, a part of me would rather the zombies just hurry it along. All right, that's what I said. And that's what I said, I talking to my family, to say, what hey. Or in talking to my coworkers, what that if that if I would go to work, I would literally have a bat. Like ah, oh, here we go again, another day. Terrible form of apocalypse. Another day of whether or not After I'm going to be infected all, it's or not. not like the ancient Norse were aware of the atomic bomb, so their monster-filled prophecy of Ragnarok was probably just the scariest ending they could imagine. It probably wasn't seen as a mercy, right? I'm genuinely not sure. Hey, look, giant doggo. Biblical cool accounts of beasts heralding the end times are often framed through more explicit language of punishment, and I think many people therefore apply retribution models to other doomsday monsters. In reality, I, wonder, I would try to try to tame monsters. Saw monsters more as bananas in the sky. More people would try to tame these guys. I'm gonna tell you this right now. Yet they lend themselves to disassociation. Because it's not like our ancestors weren't aware of other kinds of endings. Plagues, societal collapse, natural disasters. <sighs> there have always been slower, more mundane ways for our stories to conclude. Man, it's getting hot here. Over and over again, monsters have been the method that cultures have put their faith in. As if we have some innate understanding that these beasts will make for the best finale. The director of Monsters spoke explicitly about this instinct for monstrous endings when he made his next film, about a figure that looms <laughs> larger. Godzilla is back. Yo. The big new Hollywood reboot. I'm here at the new You Godzilla betcha. Ellen but I went to watch a movie of this. Edward when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was almost broken in tears. Godzilla. Because it's been a while to see a no monster giant monster. Direct movie. metaphor for atomic annihilation. Instead, he's a creature it. implied to have existed since time immemorial. A monster that it seems has always been there, but still has to uh, violently uh, write uh, the radiation. scales of the natural order when the time comes. In portraying Godzilla, Edwards has stated he drew upon our predisposition for doomsday Ugh. monsters. The idea that somewhere in the minds of humans is the expectation that a large beast will one day arrive. In I'm still, wa I'm still waiting for a giant monster. In our DNA, there was always this threat of an animal was going to come 
now we live in the modern world and our huts have got bigger like 30 stories yeah, high, which so uh, i'm gonna have to say this people for keep I keep saying this won't happen but people keep forgetting well you do realize that his genetic code continuously evolves molecularly so people need to start putting that into account for me an undeniable sense of inevitability to the imagery of godzilla the giant monster really towering over the horizon taps into something it just feels right you kind of expect it like of course of course godzilla was going to come i knew it Yo. down i always knew he was coming yep somebody adds here today either way inevitability is one of the few words well I that's it then that speaks to the impact of the monsters look at that thing of the end time the Good. creation of filmmaker christian sherba this video and its companion, Creatures of the Fog, are once again shot in the handheld what would you do in this situation format, except the feeling of raw dread that they conjure turns them into something else entirely. Watching these recordings is an exercise in sheer silent terror. If they're far from comforting, there is also a strange sense that you're watching something that was always yeah. going to happen. Like this is the natural decomposition process of Earth itself. Where you play one of those video games like where disease, apocalyptic sky, like like humanity is a disease and he's purged. Videos. In fact, the final shot of Creatures of the End Time is a shimmering flock of something, a sight both unsettling and undeniably beautiful. Birds. And you're left to wonder: Is this ending really so bad? I found myself asking the same question hey, uh, through yeah, Strange Shift Studios Chasing the Unseen, a game in which you explore a vast ruined landscape inhabited only by yourself and immense awe-inspiring creatures. The actual gameplay of Chasing the Unseen is surprisingly slow. The obvious parallel one could make is to the, the experience version. of playing Shadow, Shadow of the Galaxus. Colossus, a title with an equally desolate world and equally imposing behemoths. But Shadow of the Colossus is punctuated with moments of thrilling action, where you take your sword and drive it into a colossus head. Chasing the Unseen offers no such climactic beats. There is very little to do except reflect on the state of the world. Just to An overtly abstract look at everything. Game, just it is difficult to say definitively that the story takes place after some calamity. But that was how I interpreted the shattered landscape. And if that's the case, then surely these monsters are the culprits, the beasts who broke the world. Ugh. But unlike in Shadow of the Colossus, these creatures never attack you. They simply exist. The same is in fact true of the creatures oh, of the like, if, you time, it, if you think about it, if you think about the animals of our world, we never really they're just mon they're just creatures anything. moving around. There is, if you think about it, at times, a sense in if you think about that, aren't that these, these giant monsters, monsters just like the uh, basically just creatures the wandering around? The world that's already dying. And even if these creatures are, in fact, the source of the apocalypse, if the exit they offer is so gentle, so tranquil one can barely discern why the lights are dimming, is that such a bad way to go? Part, Hideaki well, Anno's part, uh, six and, series uh, is, in some ways, the ultimate summation of whether it's better for things to end with a monster. We finally end it. When it's finally the end. is on the table, the world should even be saved. Okay, I say that, but even Galeon eh. is so endlessly interpretable, so dense as a text. It's that weird. Any judgment on. If I remember the original, I had to feels... had to like. All right, let's uh, just re start write the ending. Out. If I remember. Spoilers ahead. Yeah, even I already know how this ends. Barely follows the perspective of Shinji, an adolescent boy conscripted to fight against monsters that seemingly seek to cause the apocalypse, but drafted into a war he doesn't understand, facing violence he can't process. Shinji isn't sure that existence is even worth fighting for. He is. Oof. He to runs away. Bluntly, an extremely troubled kid. He runs away. Shinji, he actually has like most uh, characters in even music Galeon, that he puts in his head. The support structures needed to he just basically just, the world around just basically just like the doesn't matter. Human connection. He struggles to see the value of humanity at all. Shinji's task for most of the series is to pilot a colossal Ava unit, a horrific bio machine just as bestial yeah, as the invading kill them creatures back. called the angels that it battles against. But the ultimate herald of the apocalypse is Shinji's friend Rei, who, mm, in the yeah. film that caps off the original series, ascends to a form of monstrous oh, yeah. manhood. 
The reason all this happened. She always has that ending. It's so complicated. We don't. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. But what's yeah, it's a, is that true. Ray seemingly Just watch the series. You're going to understand why it's a pain. Out of malice, but out of mercy. Her decision actually borrows from a pre-existing plan by a secret society of humans to end suffering through something called the Human Instrumentality Project. In abstract, the goal of said project is to erase our ability to hurt each other, to wage war, to make any mistakes at all by becoming a single unified collective. In practice, it means everyone turns into orange goo, and Shinji yeah. doesn't seem entirely against this plan. Evangelion is one of the only pieces of media I've seen where the protagonist, at least semi-willingly, works with the monster to end the world, but with the feeling that finally maybe ended. this is better for everyone, that maybe the kindest exit for humanity is that we all become soup. No longer It's basically soup! I'm at soup! Drop bombs or poison our planet or cause any of the other terrible endings we might have mm -hmm. closed the book with. What if it's gonna mean? end... In this situation, nothing. We're all yep. goo now. What's the point? Stop worrying. There's a lot of good. There's a lot of uh. Not where the story ads ends. today. Despite everything <laughs> he's been through, all the suffering that others have caused, mm -hmm. and he has caused for others. Shinji ultimately rejects this easy exit. Though the human condition is one of agonizing uncertainties, he decides that humanity is still worth the gamble. And so, the monster crumbles Ooh. away. I've heard people describe this series as nihilist, and though it is, undeniably, at times extremely dark and pessimistic, oh, yeah. I'm not certain There's that a like a lot sense for a story that. that concludes with the assertion that the best ending is the one where the world keeps turning. I honestly find this finale extremely uplifting. Then again, there is that final final section Ooh. of reawakening from the goo, Shinji finds the world still, in many respects, a place of ruin, where action still have oh, yeah. consequences, you want a good ending? where the struggle never ends. You gotta have to start from the, where it all ends. Maybe the true appeal of a monster is that it takes away the burden of accountability. When bombs fall, seas rise, contagion spreads, all those Ooh. things are, at least on some level, the fault of humanity. And that's not a fun concept. But if, like, a wolf eats the sun, I mean, that's just bad luck. <laughs> Funny. Fortunately, or I should say fortunately, I think it's reasonably unlikely that's where things are headed. The kind of ending we'll get probably is going to be up to humanity. And yeah. that kind of sucks. Say, ah, uh, here we go. Because the problems we're facing are yeah, great. systemic it's issues. Day in the apocalypse. The idea that there are things That's what I've been saying since 2020. is important to hold on to. I said at the beginning of the video that I hope it doesn't end at all. And genuinely, I mean that. But I think it's understandable if, on occasion, we take a moment to imagine some great beast wiping the pressure away. And then, we keep going. Yo. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, consider lending your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to well, date. I do that. All Pretty interesting. Curious. This video See was. See you in the next video. Uh, there you go. All right, so. I have to say, that was pretty interesting. It was curious to me. Because, like I said, I just randomly saw this. and I said, no, I'll make a video of this. And, yeah, I, I, have, I am not disappointed. Pretty good. I mean, the apocalypse, the monster apocalypse. What kind of apocalypse will happen? But in reality, if you think about it, like I said, what happened with the virus thing, you would think, oh, everyone's losing their minds. Everyone's going to... In fact, every time I thought there was going to be, like, something epic, like, people were going to be losing their minds every time a sort of apocalypse happens, not many people were doing... I mean, the closest one was the, was the one where people were going after toilet paper. Because of the virus. And that's the close thing. And after that, we all kind of gotten used to it. Like, every day was just another day. I mean, even I, I said to my, my family and to my coworkers when I still worked, is that, uh, yeah, that's just another day in the apocalypse. Like, just seriously, uh, that's what I kept saying. Because, literally, if you, every big event has been happening now, yeah, it's just, ah, uh, that's another day. If you think about it. Yeah. But if it actually did happen, like, everything fell, like, out of control, what would you do? Would you... Well, I'm not going to say you should pick the other option. You should keep going as long as you can. But I'm just saying that in the end, if Apocalypse does happen, what Apocalypse would you rather have? 
that I know it's against the curious uh, thing, but what apocalypse would you like to have? A giant monster, a Fallout universe, the mo magical, fa magical stuff happening, or disease, it, or whatever apocalypse you would prefer. There's like a whole bunch of apocalypse methods, uh, methods out there. Let me know in the comments what you prefer to happen. But either way, me, I prefer giant monsters. Give me a giant monster. Give me a giant monster walking. Walking like right over here. Like, oh yeah, come on. Me, if there was a catastrophe, I, this is what I would pl to plan to do. I would just like try to create my own war band, take over as much territory as possible, and then shout to the heavens that I am the ruler of the world and nobody can tell me otherwise because who's going to be alive to tell me otherwise? Come on. Come on. I, I, will literally end this, I would literally say that to the tops of whatever place it is. I'm the ruler of this world. No matter what. And then after that, I'm gone. Well, technically speaking, I'm not. Gonna, I'm still going to keep you on. I'm just saying that I will shout it off to the rooftops. But yeah, this is pretty interesting. The different apocalypse, how we would act, would probably be boring if you think about it. Because after after going through the 2020, it just feels like, huh, people are just going to act normally. Like I said before, when I was working, I literally said to my course, if there was a zombie apocalypse, I would basically they're going to have us go to work, and then I'm going to have a bat walking around. Walking around, going, oh, well, I'll be back. I gotta go to work. Just walk around the streets, just smacking dead in the head while I was also getting to work. Oh, hey, what's up? And you just start working while people just come through the drive through in their apocalypse cars or through the front. Uh, front, just say, hey, I like the order. Make sure you close that door. We don't want the undead in here. <laughs> I'll be sick about it. I literally. But seriously, what apocalypse would you prefer? Let me know in the comments. But, and also, let me know what you think about this video. Where, do you think this is correct? Or do you think it was like entirely different? Or do you think it's not correct? Let me know in the comics. Sorry that I ranted at the end here, but yeah, just pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Like I said, I just wanted to see. Eh, what the heck? Just one of those what the heck boys. Let's watch this one on the channel. But yeah, before I know, hope you enjoyed today's video. Comment, subscribe down below to join my dark army and also to see what uh, this kind of thing is. Or that was join my dark army willingly, please. Actually, yes, willingly. It preferred to be willingly because since the other method is persuasiveness. Come on, I'm your dark ruler. At this point, you should know by now that you should join my side. Come on. I'm the only thing stopping the apocalypse right now. Hmm? Yeah? Alright, like and share the video. Really helps me out, especially nowadays. And don't forget to press the black bell button to be notified whenever my videos pop up. Or could just come to my channel every once in a while to see if I've learned out. Because you know how YouTube channel is. And yeah, that's about it. So yeah, like I said, once before, let me know down in the comments what you think about the situation. But for right now, my dark apocalyptic minions, DISMISSED!